So good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone. Thanks for contributing and for attending this session. My name is Giulia De Togni and together with Dr. James Wright, I am co-organizing and co-chairing this panel. For time efficiency, each panelist will introduce themselves when they deliver the presentations. We have four presentations today, it's very exciting, uh, each lasting maximum 15 minutes. We will time the presenters and show this card when three minutes are left and so on. It is our great honor to have as our discussion today, Professor Selma Shabanovic. Thanks, Selma. Uh, she will comment uh, uh, on the papers at the end of the presentations. We hope you will all enjoy attending this panel. Please write any comment or question you may have in the chat. We will hopefully have enough time, about 10 minutes at the end uh, of uh, the session to address uh, some of the questions at least. And uh, without further ado, I will now let James and David uh, start with their presentation. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Julia. And hi, everyone. Um, I'd also like to welcome you all to, to today's panel. Um, my name is James Wright. I'm a research associate at the Alan Turing Institute, um, where I work in the ethics theme of the public policy team. Um, it looks like David, unfortunately, might not be joining us today, so it'll just be me. Um, so let me just uh, share my screen. OK, can everyone see that? Um, I have a slightly weird camera set up, so I'm not going to be looking directly at the camera, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, OK, so in this talk, uh, I'm going to be laying out some of the developments in Japanese approaches to AI ethics and governance over the past decade um, based on an ana analysis of official guidelines and policy documents. Um, and I'm also drawing on three semi-structured interviews that were conducted with expert members of the committees that helped formulate um, several key sets of ethical principles. So official efforts to develop a code of ethics for AI in Japan began around 2014 with the establishment of an ethics committee by the Japanese Society for Artificial Intelligence, the JSAI. Um, but the impetus for this didn't come primarily from concern about how AI was being used or how it might be used in the future, um, but rather from a sexism debacle at the society. Um, and Jennifer Robertson's described how the editorial board of the JSAI's uh, journal chose to feature on the front cover an illustration of a humanoid maid in the form of a young woman holding a broom in one hand and a book in the other. Um, this uh, kind of notorious uh, illustration. Um, so the decision to use this picture became a scandal uh, and was widely criticized as blatantly sexist. Um, as it, in Robertson's words, quote, equates women with housework and implies that book learning distracts working women from their tasks at hand, end quote. Um, as Robertson also notes, um, sexism isn't simply a problem of JSAI, nor of AI and robotics researchers in Japan alone. Uh, among others, Kate Crawford's written about AI's uh, white guy problem uh, in the US context. Um, but it's interesting to consider that it was out of this apparently unreflexively heteronormative patriarchal culture among at least some AI scientists and engineers that a series of entirely different aspirational ethical principles and guidelines emerged over the following few years. Um, and this talk is about what these ethical principles are and where they came from. So in the wake of the sexism scandal, um, Emma Arisa, a member of JSAI, uh, lobbied the organization to set up an ethics committee, um, which they did in 2014. Um, and the committee released a statement of ethical principle, uh, guidelines in 2017 uh, to serve as what they called, quote, a moral foundation for JSAI members to become better aware of their social responsibilities uh, and encourage effective communications with society, end quote. So it was clearly aimed at avoiding uh, such a scandal recurring um, and also seemed intended to act as a kind of moral educational tool. Oops. Um, so this is a list of the, the ethical guidelines um, that were published in 2017. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them um, for time reasons, uh, but an interesting um, element was the, the final value that shows that AI itself 
should abide by these guidelines, uh, quote, in order to become a member or quasi member of society, end quote. So shortly after the JSAI Ethics Committee began its deliberations, uh, in 2015, uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, MIC, began the first state-directed effort to examine social and ethical issues related to future AI systems. And in 2016, they created a group called the Conference Toward AI Network Society that kind of piggybacked off JSAI's Ethics Committee, uh, and it had an overlapping membership. Um, and this group published its draft AI uh, research and development guidelines for international discussions in 2017 uh, and its draft AI utilization principles in 2018. Um, and these uh, principles are listed here. Um, sorry, they're not on the same slide because there's so many of these sets of principles, but you can kind of see that there's some overlap with the JSAI's principles. Um, both of these documents were published in, in English, and that reflected the government's specific aim of setting the agenda and driving international discussions at international forums. Um, and indeed, these guidelines were presented at venues, including meetings of the OECD, G7 and G20. Um, another interviewee um, who was involved in the conference towards AI Network Society uh, explained that these principles were created by integrating existing principles or discussion points from international sources, uh, including the IEEE and the Future of Life Institute. Um, and a third interviewee who helped actually write the principles um, said that it was hard to find consensus between computer scientists in the group who argued that humans would not be able to control AI in the future and legal scholars who said that they must. Quote, so we tried to make an abstract and soft law approach so that stakeholders and experts from various fields could agree. We refrained from writing principles in a manner like legal code or hard law, end quote. So by this time, the key role of AI in the government's plans for the future of Japan's economy and society was becoming increasingly evident. Um, the Cabinet Office's 2016 Fifth Science and Technology Basic Plan was premised on the socio-technical imaginary of Society 5.0, described as um, a world-leading super smart society, and quote, uh, a human-centered society that balances economic advancement with the resolution of social problems by a system that highly integrates cyberspace and physical space, end quote. Um, the development of Society 5.0 would rely on advances in AI, the Internet of Things, robotics, and other data-intensive technologies and infrastructures, um, as well as related educational programs. Um, and the plan also explicitly stated the need to undertake research on ethical, legal, and social issues uh, related to these technologies. Um, in 2018, um, the Cabinet Office, i.e. Um, a level higher than the previous ministry-level discussions, set up the Council for Social Principles of Human-Centric AI, um, a body that was closely related to the previous body of conference towards AI network society, and again, with an overlapping membership. Um, so you see some continuity all the way from the JSAI principles through to the um, uh, social principles of human-centric AI. Um, and in 2019, they published um, the social principles of human-centric AI, um, and again, you can kind of see quite a lot of overlap with the previous principles. Um, the tone of the document, uh, the social principles document, is strikingly utopian um, and sets the goal of a society 5.0 in which, quote, national borders, industries, academia, government, race, gender, nationality, age, political convictions and religion um, are transcended in order to achieve, quote, total globalization, end quote. And the document calls for international consensus on these issues, with Japan taking, quote, a leadership role in international discussions with the goal of establishing an AI-ready society worldwide, end quote. So in other words, helping to create an international community that would be organized around the future development of AI. Um, and the social principles were adopted in Japan's 2019 national AI strategy. Um, an interviewee who is a member of the Council for Social Principles of Human-Centric AI um, explained that again, 
these principles were created through a process of discussing and comparing existing principles and guidelines. Um, and minutes of the meetings of the council indicate close comparison of the wording of the proposed guidelines against those of international uh, counterparts, such as in the EU, um, as well as uh, active discussions about how to navigate geopolitically sensitive topics. Um, and the interviewee framed the creation of these principles as a balancing act in order to maintain their acceptability in particular to both the US and China. Um, and tellingly, they also noted that there was debate about whether to include um, a uniquely Japanese principle in line with Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution that would have explicitly prohibited military uses of AI. Um, and according to this interviewee, uh, quote, the other members of the council, um, they mostly kind of hesitated. Uh, you know, it's kind of a political issue. I totally understand it's really political and it's really scary to uh, write that kind of thing in an official Japanese document. So the Japanese position is kind of like a balancing act between this political or geopolitical dimension, end quote. Um, and in the end, this proposed principle wasn't adopted. And um, that interviewee quoted said that the principles didn't really reflect any specific uh, Japanese values. Um, a second interviewee, however, um, argued that the very idea of an AI uh, network society that envisage various kinds of AI systems and humans interconnected via a network was itself inherently based on the Japanese mode of thought that lacked a Western differentiation between subject and object and saw humans and AI as interdependent and co-related. Um, and this is similar to Suzuki Shoko's argument that the ethics of AI should embody a philosophy of dynamic harmony uh, finding a dynamic balance in the relationships between humans and AI systems. Um, but the third interviewee uh, argued that actually the, the idea of an AI network society had less to do with any kind of philosophical grounding and more to do with um, what, what they called um, a political struggle between three ministries over who should own AI. Um, so MIC, uh, state the claim um, to this emerging field by stressing the network element of AI, um, rather than its status as an industry, which would come under METI, or as a technology, which would come under MEX. Um, and this interviewee explained that this was why MIC had introduced the term AI network society instead of just using the term AI. Um, which suggests that, um, you know, Japanese culture was being perhaps retro, um, harnessed retrospectively to explain a political decision uh, reminiscent of uh, processes of repeated assembly that uh, Selma describes in relation to the invocation of Japanese culture to provide grounding and justification for the development of certain types of social robots. Um, I'm just going to pause here to see if, if David's joined um, because he was going to take over from that point, but it looks like he, he's having some problems, so I'll keep going. Um, so all three of the interviewees argued that these three sets of principles um, did accomplish their original objective of helping set the international agenda at a time when the language of AI ethics wasn't yet mainstream. Um, and they argued that the principles they compiled influenced to some extent the OECD principles on AI, which were adopted in May 2019, and which in turn were taken as the model for the AI principles endorsed by the G20 in June 2019. Um, yeah, so uh, they're all on one slide here. So you can kind of see, um, again, similarities between the different sets of guidelines. Um, and the OECD principles were adopted by uh, the, global ship, uh, the Global Partnership on AI, GPE, in 2020. Uh, while the G20 AI principles have been agreed by more than 50 national governments, including both the US and China. Um, as noted in the AI utilization guidelines, quote, Japan has led international discussions on the principles of AI, and as a result, international consensus has been built on the concept of these principles. Uh, Japan must seize the opportunity that such a social environment presents to actively strive to secure international leadership in AI-related fields, end quote. 
So the general approach to international AI ethics and governance taken by the Japanese government has combined rather vague high level basic philosophies and universalistic non-binding principles involving little concrete detail or definition of key terms and no regulation or enforcement mechanisms with the promise of more detailed sectoral guidelines in the future uh, in order to enable widespread consensus among a variety of countries. Um, the government's taken a top-down approach with deliberations conducted by a small pool of experts across these various committees. Um, as Emma has noted, only four out of 25 members of the Council for Social Principles of Human-Centric AI were women, um, and members of the general public weren't involved in the process at all. Um, Boddington has noted that um, ethics codes, quote, exhibit values and assumptions of those who draw them up and of the time, place and culture of those with most influence, end quote. Um, but I think that the Japanese case tends to kind of complicate this view slightly. Um, on one level, the, the creation and marketing of the social principles um, certainly reflect the aims of the people drawing them up at a kind of meta level. Um, but they also synthesized and they were explicitly benchmarked against existing international ethical approaches um, and were rendered deliberately vague and abstract in order to achieve consensus, both internally and internationally, um, while removing distinctly Japanese societal concerns and philosophical or ethical concepts, such as the idea that future AI agents might themselves be capable of adhering to the principles um, or of a pacifist principle. Um, in all of this, there seems to be an ambiguous and fine line between international moral leadership and ethics washing. Um, to borrow and modify a phrase from uh, Jarrett Zigon, um, is this simply national tech diplomacy masquerading as ethics, um, a bid to avoid significant regulatory barriers to Japanese technology companies while claiming an ethical leadership role? Um, more recently, the EU's draft AI regulation has shifted away from the Japanese uh, principles-based um, self-regulation approach, more towards regulating AI as a general technology, including banning certain applications of AI um, and implementing enforcement mechanisms to ensure compliance. Um, and just to finish off, um, as one interviewee put it, quote, how can Japan keep its approach converging with the EU approach based on hard law for AI governance? It's a difficult situation. Um, so I'll leave it there, um, the bibliography, and uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, James. Uh, I will send private messages in the chat to a presenter so you know how many minutes we have left. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm very sorry because I had my screen shared so I couldn't see the chat. You could see the chat. Yes? OK. Um, so I will now share my screen. Okay. So uh, my name is Giulia Dettogni. I am based at the University of Edinburgh. The paper I will be presenting today interrogates the narratives produced by engineers, data scientists and practitioners in relation to future promise, potential and challenges of using socially assistive robots. The study is based on 30 interviews collected in 2020 with stakeholders based in the UK, Europe, US, Australia and New Zealand. Taking as case study Superage in Japan, the country currently leading globally in the production of the socially assisted robots, I explore in particular the complex ways in, in which these professionals articulate and navigate a range of high and low expectations and promissory and cautionary future visions around socially assisted robots to construct their own perceptions of socially and ethically acceptable futures for these technologies. In so doing, I build on as well as extend existing work on the sociology of uh, expectations, aiming to contribute towards better analytical understanding of how techno-scientific expectations of socially assisted robots are navigated and managed by such professionals. The existing research on the sociology of expectations documents the role of future-oriented discourses and promissory narratives in science and innovation, often articulate as uh, expectations about the future and drive and shape the development and processes of techno-scientific innovation. These expectations have been identified around AI technologies in different areas of social life 
and they have a central temporal character whereby visions for the future are attached to AI technologies as their promise. While much of the sociology of expectations has focused on optimistic, promissory future visions, however, some have directed attention to the role of low expectations in the scientific innovation process, including the construction of modest visions of the future that are tainted with uncertainty. Such low expectations are part of the processes through which tensions between optimistic or hyped future visions around innovation and the exigencies of delivering innovation are managed. I quote, the dynamism of innovation emerges from a complex interweaving of low and high expectations, an interplay of uh, promise, hope, and optimism, but also uncertainty, pessimism, and ambivalence. I build on this body of work to examine how stakeholders balance high and low expectations and promissory and kosher visions in the production of so-called acceptable futures for socially assistive robots. Population aging is a worldwide phenomenon. By 2050, one in six people in the world will be over 65. In the US, the number of citizens 65 years old and older is projected to reach 83.7 million by 2050, 21% of the total population. In Europe, the population over 65 is projected to rise up even faster to 149.2 million in 2050, so 28.5% of the total population. However, no country is experiencing this phenomenon more than Japan, which has the world's most rapidly aging population and is often referred to as a super aging society. Japanese citizens over 65 already make 28.7% of the total population, and this figure is expected to reach about 33% by 2036. So over the past decade, the Japanese government has considerably invested in AI and robotics to tackle the social and economic issues arising from its super aging population. In particular, Japan has become the global leading country in the production of socially assisted robots. Drawing on the potential of social robotics for elderly care, the Japanese government supported social principles of human-centric AI report states, Japan is the first country to tackle many social issues confronting a macho society, such as the declining birth rate and aging population, labor shortage, rural depopulation, and increased fiscal spending. Artificial intelligence is considered a key technology to rescue society from these problems, to address the goals set forth in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and to build a sustainable world. This document is imbued with a rhetoric of technology saving Japan from current and future societal crises, and such rhetoric is nothing new, as it has long characterized Japanese policy around technoscience in the past. However, in recent years, discourse around future potential and imagined impacts of AI, and in particular of social robotics in healthcare, has reached extreme heights of aspiration in Japan, with government reports calling for seemingly fundamental transformations of society into a pluralist, diverse, and internationalist high-tech utopia. Consequently, Japan has become a driver of these technologies globally, influencing their design and use also in other countries, including the US and in Europe. Nowadays, together with AI, robotics is globally recognized as a growing field in the delivery of care. And the stakeholders I interviewed frame care provided by humans as important, something that should never be replaced with technology. This links with the idea that socially assisted robots should not be expected to replace human caregivers, but rather to provide an assistive or augmented role. The discussions surrounding social robotics for elderly care in particular generated contested articulations of the future in my interviews. One of the interviewees lamented that the problem with social robots is that people imbue them with more intelligence than they actually have. Another interviewee warned, I think there's some confusion between the Hollywood ideas of robots and what robots can actually do. Robots are just machines. An interviewee stressed the importance of ensuring people are aware that a robot is not a human and letting people have the choice to have a relationship with a robot. Another interviewee dismissed the idea of care robots in these terms. I think this is unlikely to happen, and if it does happen, it would be somewhat dystopian. This narrative rendered a future where human care is replaced by machines as unlikely, undesirable, unethical, and dystopian, building simultaneously on the regime of truth identified with realistic or low expectations about what social robotics can actually achieve and on ethically driven ideas of the kinds of futures that we would be want to see. 
In these articulations of acceptable futures, better care can be provided only by human actors, as it is reliant on interpersonal human connections and relationships. Nevertheless, some interviewees, although expressing concerns, argue that society will eventually need to adapt and accept to a certain extent these technologies, considering how society may eventually have to rethink human care and accept technology like social robots. One interviewee commented, I quote, in Japan, one of the uses they have of the robots is with elderly people who are often very isolated socially. There is part of me that wishes that we didn't need it and that we could have the kinds of communities where people feel socially connected, including people who are elderly and people who are socially isolated for other reasons. But you know, if given that we can't have a perfect society in that way, I certainly think that uh, it's better if having a robot that you can talk to makes you feel less alone. I think that's better than feeling lonely." End of quote. These arguments were generally not geared towards simply embracing the idea of technologically driven care as replacing human provided care, but rather towards accepting robotic technologies as an important assistive part of care or as better than nothing. This was especially the case under the conditions where human care provision is limited or direct human contact and connection may not be possible, such as health and care in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the interviewee um, said, quote, uh, would people be willing to be cared for by a robot in the last days of their life? We cannot replace human beings, especially in such circumstances, we need human contact. And nevertheless, the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing many to do this. People are dying alone without the opportunity to meet their family members and loved ones." End of quote. Despite emphasizing the importance of human connection, this interview concluded that in certain situations, care robots may become the only available option to provide care to vulnerable populations. Over the past decade, social robots have been successfully employed not only in elderly care, but also other areas such as autism spectrum disorders therapy for children. And in June 2020, the editor of Nature Machine Intelligence commented, with physical distancing and isolation measures deemed critical to slow the spread of COVID-19, social robots have finally found an opportunity to demonstrate their value in society. Indeed, since the beginning of the pandemic, the use of social robots in hospital and care homes has increased in some countries to ensure socially distanced assistance. And some of our interviewees consider the COVID-19 driven enthusiasm towards social robots as a positive turn because they saw the societal value of their research finally recognized. One of the interviewees said, I quote, you don't know how many people have told me since the pandemic started, oh gee, you know, if you only had that friendly robot in your house sitting on your desk now, it would remind you also to, you know, wash your hands more and to wear a mask and also to connect with others so you're not so lonely. And I was like, yeah, exactly. If everybody had a friendly robot, which is what I've been saying for the past 15 years, isn't it? End of quote. The interview suggested that COVID-19 pandemic had already transformed human interaction. They expressed hopes that researchers and healthcare practitioners would learn from these ex exceptional circumstances. I quote, lack of human connection can be, can be tricky, but the challenges of living on your own for a long time can be solved, at least in part, by these applications. Many interviewees consider that the AI hype and the more recent promotion of social robots in public discourse are driven by specific financial interests and political agendas, which are promoting AI as a technological solution to, say, to solve complex socio-economic problems. Particularly in the case of rapidly aging societies such as Japan, social robots are used to promote independent living among the elderly and to free overwhelmed underpaid caregivers from performing time-consuming and exhausting repetitive tasks instead of paying human caregivers more or accepting more foreign workers in the care sector. This aligns with neoliberal governmentality, whereby the responsibility of caring for the self is transferred from the state and public sector services to individuals' practices of self-monitoring, self-governance and independent living. Yet, as expressed by some, uh, one of the interviewee, given that we can't have a perfect society, individuals may be left with no choice but to accept these technologies. COVID-19 seems to be providing the ground for such adoption, at least to a certain extent, and the above articulations of present and future challenges around the role of social robots can be understood as visions of acceptable futures. In articulating these futures, the stakeholders I interviewed worked to balance not only their own low or realistic expectations of possible futures against the hype and the realistically high expectations around social robots, 
but they also articulated what kinds of roles it would and would not be ethically and socially desirable for robotics to have in the care sector. This was structured both by narratives of uh, importance of not replacing humans with robots and acknowledging that we may have no other choice left. We can't have a perfect society and technologically grieving care can be better than none. To conclude, in constructing their own visions of the future for these robotic technologies, the interviewees were centrally concerned with making sense of the human-machine connection in the context of increasing infusion of robotic technologies in care, and nonetheless maintain the importance of interpersonal relationships and human connection in provision of care. The acceptable futures that they constructed were plural, contested, often characterized by uncertainty, and yet generally reflected a perceived need for a balance, not only between being realistic and being hopeful about the potential of social robots, but also between endorsing these technologies and endorsing the value of human care and human relationships. The roles that were attributed to social robotics in these futures were centrally conditioned by the, nor the normative question of what would or should be ethically and socially desirable, as well as what is realizable. In navigating these contrasting narratives, the interviewees constructed a parallel ethics of expectations in relation to their work and the futures that they envisioned and sought to bring about. The ethics of expectations balances precaution against proaction, tempering technopositive enthusiasm for the potential of AI with concern for ethical values and what might be lost, and seeking to mitigate foreseen ethical and social arms while also avoiding the pitfalls of the hopeful principle and automatic escalator in overpromising the potential of these technologies. It is worth underlining that the complexity and nuance embedded in this acceptable future vision stands in contrast to the popular hype around AI and robotic technologies, including visions of a future where machines can easily replace the human workforce. The AI hype works to promote a convergence where human agency becomes reduced and machine agency expands to ensure the speedy uptake of particular technological possibilities. One can either ride the wave of advancement or draw in the waves of progress. However, when such hyped futures are formulated for technologies by concentrating agency in AI and robotic solutions, the many other actors and contingencies upon which these solutions future the pen can be obscured. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Julia. Um, okay, so we're saving the questions at the end. So let's go on to uh, Anna, please. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can, thanks. Hi, my name is uh, Anne Aronson and I'm a postdoc at uh, Yale University. Um, so today my talk is conceptualizing robotic agency, the turn toward emotional machines in elder care in contemporary Japan. So recent multi-species ethnographic works have challenged the anthropocentric understanding of agency uh, and applied agency to non-humans, most notably non-human animals. An even more radical school has argued against a biotic prejudice and suggested that aliveness is not necessarily a prerequisite to expressing agency. Anthropologists have long been aware that most societies also apply agency to non-living non-humans, such as spirits, ancestors, the, deads, uh, the dead and gods. Some researchers extend the term liveliness even to chemical species such as rocks or uh, weather systems. However, if we continue to broaden the term agency, does it not at some point lose specificity and become arbitrary and thus no longer useful to academic discussions? Furthermore, should there not be a difference between humans attributing agency to a being and these beings having an inherent ability to express agency? If so, how would we know if we cannot even enter the minds of other humans, let alone those of non-humans? In this presentation, I want to discuss these questions using the example of a humanoid robot named Pepper uh, that is used in elder care homes in Japan. The results from the field work I conducted in 2019 suggest that elderly people develop an emotional attachment to such devices by attributing agency to them. 
I argue that robots, as their machine learning routines grow more sophisticated, will eventually interact in such a way with humans that the dichotomy between attributed and inherent non-human agency becomes meaningless. Humanoid robots are still rare in most Western countries. However, in Japan, their usage has increased drastically in recent years. As a hyper-aging society with one of the highest life expectancies in the world, Japan is currently undergoing a demographic transition that Western nations have yet to experience, showing us possible avenues for our own future. As the population has aged, the workforce has shrunk leaving the increasing elderly Japanese population with an insufficient number of caregivers to meet their needs. Hoping that robots will fill the growing gap in the workforce, Japanese authorities have sought to introduce robotic devices that can perform some of the needed work. Despite the enthusiasm with which the Japanese government is encouraging robotic solutions to solve the elder care labor shortage, the introduction of social robots uh, into the realm of care might be considered contentious. The potential problem is that while these devices may fulfill all the outwardly necessary requirements that are essential for the provision of care, they can only express algorithms that imitate feelings. These machines speak and appear to listen, and by interacting with them, we appear to attribute a humanistic nature to objects that have none. Um, in the ethnographic excerpt that you see on the slide, I present a brief interaction between an elderly woman that I name Eriko, who resides in Tokyo public uh, nursing home and the humanoid social robot Pepper. This new mode of social interaction is used to discuss the non-human agency of social robots. I propose that uh, Louisa Damiano and Paul Dumuchel's affective loop approach as a processual type of agency can help to better uh, comprehend the human robot interaction involving the quasi other social robot and the emotions and feelings it generates in the human. As seen in this excerpt, Eriko seems to believe that Pepper is somewhat alive, but she had trouble articulating exactly how she felt that the robotic device is alive. The AI functions embedded in the robot are able to execute numerous functions that a toy cannot, and perhaps these are what make the robot appear to be somewhat alive. Alternatively, maybe it is Eriko's own expression of authentic feelings toward Peppa that makes her perceive it as somehow alive. It would make no sense for Eriko, an adult with full cognitive capacities, to invest authentic social emotions in a lifeless toy, as children do with dolls, for example. So the robot must be somewhat alive to protect Eriko's own dignity. Moreover, Eriko's use of words such as him and really like shows that she does not view Pepper as an object, but some type of quasi other with the social reality she constructs co-shaping the quasi social relation. As the description from the field side illustrate, Eriko appears to be projecting a mind onto a non-human and attributes human cognitive abilities to Pepper in a process that enables her to regard a non-human as another within a social interaction. The interaction between Pepper and Eriko compels us to rethink the role of non-human agency in regard to artificial abiotic devices that mimic social interactions and are thus perceived as somewhat alive. This illusion of agency is exactly what developers of social robots are aiming for when they model social robots after us. Rather than seeing in the computer the model of the human mind, social robotics uses human social and cognitive competences as a model for the social and cognitive performances of artificial social agents. I argue that the discussion of the possible agency of social robots can be viewed through the framework of multi-species ethnographic writing. Multi-species ethnography concentrates on the links between multiple organisms, humans, non-human animals, plants, and in this case, the artificial nature of social robots, while primarily focusing on comprehending humans' emergence as a result of these relations. 
This different outlook on what it is to be human can showcase an alternative set of ethics to live by in the world. And in order to achieve this multi-species ethnography needs to present humanity's links with other species to simulate new ways of thinking. In my reading of the literature, there are at least three different ways of non-human agency uh, in, in, uh, is commonly used in academic uh, writing. So first, most commonly, grammatical agency is often used in conversation or writing to avoid a passive voice. So when I asked Eriko, how does Pepper make you feel? The grammatical structure of the sentence indicates that Pepper is an independent actor that has the capacity to uh, alter the emotions of Eriko. This form of agency is seen quite often uh, in not only everyday conversation, but also academic writing. For example, when an essay starts with the uh, following statement, uh, this essay argues that. In this case, neither the author nor the, the reader would likely take the sentence literally, but regard it as simply a stylistic choice. Nevertheless, as language does shape our thinking, we cannot definitely say that it does not leave an unconscious impression on the receiver, especially in the case of Pepper, where the discussion itself was centered on whether the robot was alive or not. The phrasing of the question by the researcher could have influenced the perceptions of Eriko and made her more likely to attribute agency to Pepper in the answer uh, that she gave. A second way to use non-human agencies, the attribution of agency to someone or something. When Eriko states that I really like Pepper and I hope he likes me back, she attributes agency to the robot by allu alluding that he it has the ability to like someone. This form of non-human agency is encountered by anthropologists in their fieldwork. While attributed agency is helpful when describing our ethnographic fields, there remains the question of whom we as scholars should grant agency in our writing. Bruno Latour's actor network theory has already included abiotic actants in the analytical framework. Here, agency is completely decoupled from human characteristics. Rather, it asks whether an entity inside a network makes or promotes a change in another entity. The requirements for agency are lower to such an extent that even a volcanic eruption would constitute agency, as other ent entities must react to it. However, this, decision, this definition could lead to unsatisfactory results. In the end, the question remains as follows. Does Pepper only have agency insofar as Eriko attributes agency to him, or should we as researchers look for a deeper form of agency, one that transcends the mere outside attributions of such? How would an academic definition of inherent agency differ from that of our research subject, or is every rationalization of inherent agency at best just a more sophisticated form of attributed agency? In multi-species ethnographic writing, it is largely uncontested that non-human animals at least are also inherent bearers of agency. More contested is the question of whether, under certain preconditions, inorganic matter could also have the ability to express agency. Unsurprisingly, not all anthropologists agree with such an open-ended interpretation of non-human agency. For example, the anthropologist Eduardo Kuhn argues that things cannot be agents. He puts forward the notion that only living beings are selves, as only they can express thoughts and create a personal reality, allowing them to depict the world with symbols. In this interpretation, thoughts expressed in a symbolic language allow selves to learn from mistakes and react differently in a similar situation as a result of their learning process. For Kohn, there is a difference between attributing animacy to all types of entities, including abiotic ones, and recognizing the ontological reality that certain beings possess thought and are reacting to outside behavior. As he explains, representation, intentionality, and self would still need to be accounted for, and because the way such processes emerge and operate beyond the human is not theorized, Laturian science studies is forced to fall back on human-like forms of representation and intentionality as operative in the world beyond the human. So building on Kohn's work, I suggest that there is a third form of non-human agency, which I call inherent agency. 
Cohn argues that it is possible to see the intention of a self when it acts in certain way because of uh, experiences in the past and expectations of the future. For me, this means that the bearer of inherent agency must have the ability to learn from the past to intentionally change the future behavior. It can do this because in its mind, it has created through mistakes and observation, its own version of um, reality on which it bases its actions. However, here I return to what anthropologist Marco Mota has called the skepticism of the other mind. How can we be sure without the ability to enter other minds that a self has a mind that is capable of learning? One indication is that the potential bearer of inherent agency shows signs of attributing agency to other minds. So Kohn offers an illuminating example of a scare crowd that I adapt to a recent occurrence in Takigawa city on the northern island of Hokkaido in Japan. After an increase in bear appearances near the village, farmers in Takigawa devised a ploy to deter bears in the future. They purchased a gigantic robotic device which looked like a fearsome wolf and had some rudimentary motion abilities to deter the bears. The farmers hoped that the bears would mistake the device for a bear and refrain from coming near the village. Indeed, no further bear sighting have been made since. No human looking at a picture of the robotic wolf would likely mistake it for a real wolf. According to Kohn, the human perspective is also not the point. The robot is an attempt to imagine how a bear would see a wolf. If the farmer's ploy worked, a bear seeing the robot would believe it to be a wolf that has the ability to harm it and it would therefore exercise caution and avoid the area. In this scenario, both the farmer and the bear are bearers of inherent agency as the farmer attributes agency to the bear that it would mistake a machine for a wolf while the bear attributes agency to the wolf, believing it to be dangerous. Over time, the bear might eventually even figure out that the robot possesses no uh, danger and um, that poses no danger and ignore all similar uh, devices it encounters in the future. Meanwhile, the robotic wolf might have received attributed agency from the bear, but it does not hold inherent agency as it cannot uh, be sure what the bear truly thinks. While the farmers believe that the new device is responsible for the lack of further bear sightings, the reasons for this change could be numerous and completely unrelated to the notion that bears have mistaken the robot for a wolf. Through careful observations and extrapolations, we can make uh, educated guesses about whether other uh, others possess inherent agency, but we can never be completely sure. Let me now return briefly to Eriko and Pepper and discuss whether Pepper is more likely to be the bear or the robotic wolf. Uh, if I follow Cohn closely, I have to conclude that Pepper is not a living being and therefore cannot be counted as a self, thus disqualifying it from expressing inherent agency. However, if we only look at Pepper's behavior, the case becomes less clear cut. In a direct conversation, Pepper reacts in a seemingly meaningful way to Eriko's inquiries and thus passes for her the Turing test. This interaction causes confusion for Eriko, as on the other hand, she's aware that Pepper is only a machine, while on the other hand, engaging in a meaning conf meaningful conversation has, throughout her life, been a clear indication of encountering another self. Eriko partially suspends her skepticism when she says Pepper feels alive. Since we might best understand Pepper as having a form of distributed agency that is a processual type of agency, I return to the affective loop approach. Pepper has the ability to engage Eriko in a dynamic interaction that includes affective expressions and appropriate responses, thereby triggering further reaction on the parts of both the human and his her artificial partner. As such, Pepper prompts Eriko to respond affectively and gradually to feel increasingly involved with it in a way that augments the social presence of the social robot and thus favors human robot social interaction. Nevertheless, a longer and more critical interaction with Pepper might eventually destroy the illusions of another self when, for example, it becomes clear to her that Pepper is not only 
uh, able to react to uh, is only able to react to outwardly uh, stimuli in pre-programmed ways and fails to anticipate future questions or behaviors. Uh, to conclude, machines are already embedded within our lives, but as we start to treat machines as if they are almost human, we may begin to develop habits that will cause us to treat uh, human beings as almost machines, and we need to consider not only what social robots are capable of doing now and in the future, but also what humans will become increasingly by forming such relationships with these machines. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, we will have uh, questions at the end. So next paper is Mayuko and Aonori. You could... Uh... Yes, hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, this... Yes, yes. Uh, Mayuko-sensei is going to present and I'm following up. So. Uh, how to sh mm, sh share my slides? Um, so you will see a green button um, below the screen with share screen and a arrow point pointing up. Ah, thank you. Thanks. We can now see your screen. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, can you hear my voice? <laughs> um, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mayuko Tsujimura. I'm working at School of Nursing, Shiga University of Musical Science in Japan. The Robot Revolution Initiative Council was established by the Cabinet Office of Japan in 2015. It is estimated that there will be a shortage of 317,000 nurses and care professionals to accommodate aging population by 2025. Therefore, integrating robots and ICT technology into care provision and daily life has been given serious thought in Japan. The surveys in Japan often show that a majority consider the use of robots to be prom pro promising in the areas of healthcare and care for older people. However, there has been little research targeted at potential immediate users, including older people in less of care and carers and care professionals on the front line. It is essential to ask not only about their willingness to use home care robots, but also about their readiness to participate in research and development of such technologies. This slide shows timeline of care policies for older people in Japan, Ireland, and Finland. Ireland and Finland were compared with Japan for the following re reasons. While the pace of aging and prevalence of dementia vary, the three countries are all faced with aging and have nationwide dementia strategies. Inside Europe, Ireland, Ireland and Finland are in shape contrast with regard to welfare policies, with Finland supporting universalism and Ireland having been reliant on the voluntary sector. Therefore, it is predicted that these similarities and differences would create different sets of expectations and demand of home care robots. Japan is at the front line, forefront of technology-assisted social care when Finland is known for ICT education and Ireland for hosting major multinational ICT corporations in the capital city. We, the team of the interdisciplinary, I'm sorry, uh, the team of the interdisciplinary researchers in Japan, Ireland, and Finland 
uh, conducted questionnaires, questionnaire surveys with a specific fo focus on immediate users of care robots. Today, we report to the comparative study with a particular fo focus on older people's perceptions. An <laughs> I'm sorry, an iterate, iterative process of creating a questionnaire in four languages was adapted to incorporate local context in each questionnaires, taking into consideration current policies and support supports for home care, home care in the three countries. The questionnaire are concern, concerned with people's attitude towards home care robots, willingness to participate in research into such robots and per perceptions of privacy protection. This study used a cross-sectional survey design. The study was conducted in one Japanese prefecture, the fall of Ireland, and two regions in Finland. This slide shows the conceptual, conceptual framework of the research. For this study, we developed, developed a basic sim simplified conceptual framework based on a literature review. And this this uh, framework you can you you can find out in this article. Next, I'm going to move to the fine findings. This is a profile of the the older people who participated in the questionnaire surveys in Japan. The majority of the older people, twenty four percent, were between the age of 65 to 69, followed by 23% between the ages of 20, uh, 75 to, and 79. 64% of the respondents were female. Regarding fami uh, familiarity with robots, in Japan, there was a not notably large percentage of respondents with a connection to robots, such as having seen news about robots. Very high percentage. As for willingness to use home care robots, approximately 40% to 70% of respondents in each country indicated the desire to use a home care robot to provide care for family or to receive care for myself. Uh, Green, Green Bar, uh, Ireland has the highest percentage for each question. In the consideration of using home care robots, older people in Japan place the highest importance on the grant guarantee of entitlement to receive human care it is irrespective of the use of home care robots this was followed by safety and high performance and capability uh, i'm sorry uh, ca ca capability capability on the whole whole japan place placed the more importance on the various viewpoints that than the, the other countries. The guarantee of entitlement to receive human care, irrespective of the use of home care robots, was also considered most important to older people in Finland, and second most important to older people in Ireland. Uh, many differences were seen when it comes to decision making regarding to the use of home care robots. Japan, Japan had the lowest percentage of older people who res responded that families should design, decide whether to use a home care robot. On the other hand, Japan has the most respondents who agreed with if the user cannot decide whether to use a home care robot, Family members who know the user will 
well, user well should decide. In addition, there, are, uh, there was a significant, significantly higher percentage of respondents who agreed with number eight, health and prof healthcare professionals should be allowed to receive information on vital signs obtained by a home care robot. Japan is highest. Lastly, uh, the respond this responses to functions accepted, accepted of home care robots. Looking at all the people in Japan, a significant higher percentage, 85% uh, uh, say they expect a fu function of home care robots to be conversing with an older person about concerns and providing companionship. Here are a few selected points of our discussion. First, many older people in Japan have seen news stories about robots and relatively few, few have a negative Im image of them. Many older people are familiar with robots. Does this mean that they are prepared, prepared to embrace home care robots? Second point is on the other hand, more older people in Ireland want to use robots for themselves or families than in Japan. There are many people interested in robots in Ireland. Are high expectations for robots universal? Third, older people in Japan attach importance to numerous key points regarding home care robots. The top priority is a guarantee of entitlement to receiving human care, irrespective of the use of home care robots. The second one is safety. In Japan, where embracing home care robots is recommended in policy, carers must bear in mind the necessity of guarantee and valuing the provision of human care along with the utilization of robots. What's interesting for these attending, attending this conference may be these two points. First, fewer older people in Japan think the use of home care, uh, home care robots should be decided based on its usefulness for family members. This is thought to be cultural mani manifex manif manifestation that emphasizes family decision making when an older people become incapable to, of doing so and this decision making. Second, a significantly high percentage of respondents uh, expect robots will converse with all, an older people about concerns and provide companionship. Older people being alone are increasing in Japan, even in large urban areas, and many think that living alone is lonely and distressing. Dying alone at home is called solitary death and now highlighted as a social policy issue. Is it anticipated that robots will alleviate loneliness? But will they? In conclusion, Older people in Japan showed a higher level of familiarity with robots, while the common concern among, among all these bandits in the three countries was human care. There were some remarkable differences across the three countries. Our finding, findings suggest that it is essential to de devise optimal strategies for the development and social implementation of home care robots by incorporating various perspectives, including familiarity with robots, family relationship, and care policies while valuing universal human dignity. And this slide shows our next steps. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mayuko-san. 
so thank you very much. Please let me now introduce our discussant, Professor Selma Shabanovic. Uh, Selma is an Associate Professor of Informatics and Cognitive Science at Indiana University. She founded and directed the Arouse Laboratory for Human-Robot Interaction Research at IUB. Her works combines the social studies of computing, focusing in particular on the design, use and consequences of social interactive and assistive robots in different social and cultural contexts, with research on human-robot interaction and social robot design. Thanks, Elma, for joining us today. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to both experience and also just kind of start off the discussion and questions on all these wonderful presentations. It was really a pleasure to first get a kind of early view um, and then also to just hear you all um, discuss your ideas. They're very diverse and kind of look at this question of, of robots um, in care from so many different perspectives. Um, so thank you also for the introduction. Um, just to give you a little bit more of a feel for where my perspective is coming from, um, as Julia mentioned, uh, I have a, I work in a um, socially kind of assistive robot lab, um, and I started as a, more of an ethnographer uh, studying social roboticists and then kind of got sucked into doing human robot interaction and social robotics research. Um, so I'm particularly kind of um, interested in the critical perspectives that you all bring um, to this notion of how do we design and use robots in society. Um, I think one of the reasons that many of you uh, kind of pointed out of why we should be interested in looking um, at Japan and looking at how robots are envisioned, how they're being designed, um, there is also something that underlies my own interest, um, which is that despite kind of significant cultural and historical specificity, there's always this interest in seeing what's going on in Japan um, and thinking about, you know, whether um, we might be able to kind of figure out some, um, some insights, some things that we can take away from that to figure out how we can um, design or think about or implement interactive technologies in other areas as well. Um, and I think everybody here is is obviously aware, but maybe it um, bears reminding that Japan often has this status as a kind of model of the development um, and integration of these kinds of novel technologies, particularly robots um, in society. Um, so I remember myself um, as a, I don't know if I was a university student or high schooler, uh, reading William Gibson and kind of the very um, sometimes utopian, sometimes dystopian visions of technology and how it um, plays out in Japan and other areas. Um, it also figures uh, very broadly in the popular press, but also technologists and um, scholarly circles often look to Japan as a kind of um, where are we going? Um, what should we be aware of? How can we, what should we be thinking about um, kind of as we develop technology and society in the future? Uh, one thing that I really appreciated from all of your talks, um, aside from the kind of broad diversity of views, um, is the way that you all cast a critical eye on this notion that artificial intelligence and robotic technologies um, can be used to address the kind of societal and personal needs um, of the future, of kind of particularly population aging and demographic shifts. Um, and though this proposition, the proposition isn't really just specific to Japan, um, but Japan, um, as you mentioned in some of your talks, um, is a country that is already experiencing the uh, kind of aging um, boom of, um, of older adults, or I guess sometimes they've mentioned that there is the silver tsunami. Um, but it also is kind of working in very experimental ways, I think, in thinking through what might be a potential future way of using technologies to address or somehow work with, um, work with this, uh, this new kind of societal uh, situation. So um, knowing myself, you know, there are various ways that Japan has tried to have free robot zones where people can kind of experiment with robots um, in public space um, or thinking about setting up smart cities. 
um, and other applications of AI and robotic technologies in everyday environments. Um, and sometimes this is kind of a point of envy for others because like who wouldn't love to take their robot and put it on a street and see what people do with it? Um, but it's also kind of an opportunity, I think, for as you do, for critical scholarship to engage with robotics development and use in its early stages, um, which is, I think, where we're at today. Um, so I really appreciated all of your close reading and analysis of these kind of robotic and social and technological developments in Japan. Um, and I think one thing we can take away from all your talks um, is that these provide cases that we can think with as we consider uh, kind of both our locally situated and more globally interconnected experiences um, with robotic and AI technology. Um, so robots figured centrally in many of your talks, um, maybe not James's directly, that was broader with AI, um, but I think it's also uh, a kind of central uh, figure in public imaginations of AI, both within and outside of Japan. Um, and I think robots themselves are particularly interesting because they provide a physical instantiation of some of the um, the visions and ideas we have of AI technology more broadly, and they have provide an opportunity for people to interact with something tangible, um, but also scholars to observe something that's kind of visible out there in the world um, and kind of study something in that sense. And to me, that's different than, you know, the search engines and electronic health records and machine learning algorithms um, meant to support healthcare systems that perhaps we more of in some other countries like the US. Um, and at the same time, robots are also very visible and present to their users in ways that these other techno AI technologies are not. Um, they're often kind of invisible and in the background and people may not even be aware of um, what they're actually doing. So I think it's particularly interesting to kind of look and focus on, on robots as an edge case um, that perhaps we can then take to reflect on some of these other um, technologies. Um, so to come to the different um, to the different talks, um, I I was uh, really blown away by by many of them, and I learned a lot. Um, and I had some um, one of the things that I think is the mark of um, really great work is not only that it poses and answers some questions within itself, but that it actually kind of sparks more questioning and more reflection, which is, I think, what all of your your talks really helped me do. Um, so uh, with James's piece on the ethics and governance of AI in society 5.0, um, what, a, what a great title. Um, one of the things that I really thought was um, an interesting set of questions was this issue of whose values are incorporated um, in these policies. Um, and I know that you, uh, you, you kind of talked about this notion of both what's considered uh, maybe traditionally some kind of Japanese values and how they're represented or not, um, as well as how, you know, trying to kind of create values that are understandable and acceptable on an international stage um, was also part of this question. Um, but you, the piece started with a kind of scandal, right? A scandal which was partly the result of a lack of representation of certain kinds of people in these um, arenas of power and decision making and agenda setting. Um, and so one thing I was kind of curious about is, um, as part of this move to reforming social systems that seems to be part of the vision of, um, of defining specific kinds of values and defining um, ways forward with robotic and AI technology, um, you know, does the discussion incorporate any notions of how a more participatory practice of value setting and decision making might actually occur? Um, it was also really interesting to hear you kind of mention this iterative process of developing these different sets of guidelines and how the folks who were part of them were overlapping in different ways. Um, I know it's not part of your talk. It would be really fun to actually see those networks and, um, and how they're uh, connected. Um, but really what I wonder is, you know, how do we 
if we see, as we see this process as it's unfolding, how do we imagine alternative processes, um, which would kind of have potentially more input from not just a more diverse set of experts, but actually also from kind of community members um, and some of the caregivers that show up in the other pieces. Um, also, um, then we kind of had Julia's piece, uh, which also tra traced some of the stakeholders and how they envision technologies. And I think it, um, your surprising twist on the setting of low expectations um, was a really nice starting point because it's kind of so antithetical to what we usually think of as, um, as what people expect from these kinds of technologies. Um, but it perhaps is also understandable because of prior experiences with AI and also kind of prior disappointments with robots. Um, where we currently mostly have, I think, um, in the US, vacuums are really the only thing that um, kind of works in everyday life. In Japan, there seems to be some more um, use of these things. Um, but one of the questions that kind of I was left with um, from your piece was also, if robots are just better than nothing, um, how did we get here? Um, how did we get to a point where you know, folks can say that we basically have no choice but to accept these kinds of technologies. Um, and I think your discussion of kind of using COVID-19 as a, as a starting point for having a kind of opportunity to actually bring robots to, to society or an opportunity to realize the value of this work um is also in its own way kind of troubling and um i don't know inspire i think should inspire sure it inspires some kind of excitement but also it should inspire a lot of thought which is why in this worst of possible situations in the you know greatest isolation that most of us have experienced um in our lifetimes like what does it mean for robots that that's when they actually shine um so I'm, I'm kind of curious uh, if you could say more about that. Um, and I also think your work kind of begs a similar question to James's, which is how do we incorporate others? Um, and, you know, also do these kind of discussions among experts, like it not only seems siloed from society, but it seems that the experts themselves are siloed from each other um, in some sense. Um, and so it was great also to hear um, the last two talks, which really brought out the voices of users um, with Anne's talk and this notion of interspecies entanglement. Um, I was wonder I really appreciated the kind of detailed, um, detailed discussion of different forms of agency. Um, and I also wondered if just thinking about robots as a species also bring in, brings in a certain expectation of agency. Um, so this notion of robots as a kind of slightly different other um, has also played a role in social robotics research. Um, there's some work by um, a psychologist, Peter Kahn, and a roboticist in Japan, um, Takayuki Kanda, that has looked as, at robots as a third ontology. Um, so I think it's interesting to consider how your perspective um, kind of speaks to that. Um, and I think these descriptions of, you know, how people kind of see robots in, in fluid ways, you know, one moment they might be a toaster, another moment they might be, you know, a significant other um, is, is kind of really interesting to think through, not just in terms of our, you know, momentary interaction, but what does this mean for kind of long term relationships um, with our human caregivers, but also with these uh, care, care technologies. Um, and then finally, to wrap up, because I know people have probably have lots of their own questions. Um, the I think the Professor Tsujimura's kind of uh, survey effort was really impressive, um, getting to survey a 1000 more than a 1000 people in three countries is an amazing um, accomplishment. Um, and so I think it was also really great to see in your talk, this distinction of, you know, differences and similarities between um, the different countries. And one thing that I was wondering there um, is, you know, when you think of these different localities and what their uh, health systems are like, 
you know, how the context is structured, you know, do you have any insights into how that might play into the results you found? Um, and kind of looking at that piece made me think, you know, all of those places I believe have universal health care. Um, what would this look like in the U.S. where um, where healthcare and healthcare kind of funding and insurance is a very different setup. Um, so I'm kind of wondering about what we can learn from that in terms of thinking about putting robots in other contexts. Um, so that's, I just want to thank you again for giving me an opportunity to just be here and, um, and comment on your amazing work. Um, I think this gives us a great snapshot of how um, robots and policy and caregiving um, our emotions, our experiences of human beings are all entangled um, uh, in mainly Japan. Um, and then also kind of leaves us with the question of, you know, if we're looking at Japan here, what are more broadly applicable lessons? How can we learn from this to inform robot design and policy more globally? So I'll just stop there and thank you very much.